Good morning, folks. We've got a look at weather, solar forcing of climate, and a new coring revealing some of the recent geomagnetic excursions on this planet. We're in the beginning of another one now. But we begin at spaceweathernews.com and we're finding the last 48 hours on our star. Behind the departing southern coronal hole, a brightness point emerges. Could be another round of umbral production here afoot for the sun. The solar wind actually looks like it took a minor coronal hole stream midday, and that is already backing down this morning. That's top left at the purple line, and then in the green bars at the bottom, we can see that it was all minor, but the phi angle shift of hitting the sun's current sheet actually provided the greater geomagnetic disturbance about a day earlier. Quick look here at the tropical risks in the Atlantic. Florida will watch that storm decide he'd rather go for some catfish Kubion and bend northwest while the systems out to sea curl northward away from landfall. Impact to New Orleans should be tomorrow. A real quick grinds my gears up first when three years ago I submitted a paper to this journal on the solar control of the Amundsen Low. It was based not only on the statistical windfall, but the coupling mechanisms that allow solar wind modulation of the stratosphere to rapidly force the troposphere below within this global electric circuit. And one of these authors was brought into peer review. It was denied due to, quote, known controlling factors of the Amundsen Low. Well, here he is publishing what he said wasn't real, what I said to this journal three years ago. Up next, piggybacking on the August 23rd morning show about electric dust in the atmosphere, this story is about Rosby wave breaking preceding dust frontogenesis. This has known electromagnetic components and these Rosby waves can be controlled by certain aspects of solar activity, like the rest of Earth's electromagnetic and magnetohydrodynamic properties. A quick peek in on how CMIP6 is performing as a climate model paradigm compared to its predecessor. For some weather events, it is better. For others, it's worse. In general, the results of all of them are still mathematically unsatisfactory, showing the enormous bias, uncertainty, and need for expanded electrical modeling which of course we have been discussing all year. We're not done at the sun just yet. If it seems like one of those, uh, duh, sentences here, remember that these scientists work in a field that still largely denies the solar influence on climate. And with their continued discovery of coupling from the ionosphere and stratosphere down to the surface, it is becoming the elephant in the room when it's the sun that controls those upper layers of our planet. This is taking things a step further. Even those who use solar particle forcing often generalize and try to pick out significant events. Here, they are suggesting that it's not just the particle and field coupling to the geomagnetic system, but we've got to account for every jot and tittle if we want to know our atmosphere. I'd say I couldn't put it better myself, but that's pretty much the gist of Weatherman's Guide to the Sun, third edition. Our textbook covers the solar forcing in detail, and not just of climate, but tropical storms, lightning, earthquakes, human health, and technology. And in the newly added Chapter 8, we go over the magnetic excursion happening at this planet and how the sun is involved in the process. And this brings us to our final story. A new Black Sea core shows a number of previous magnetic excursion events on Earth, including the Greenland and Vostok event, the major Lachamp event, and the Mono Lake excursion, which they are saying may be even younger than they previously believed. Of course, the dating of these items is a rather challenging endeavor considering that parts of the world should see different isotope concentration based on different field morphology and solar activity, only half of the Earth faces the sun at a time, these are not things they take into account. Of course, even with these errors, the main point is that these events seem to happen every 10 to 15,000 years. It's been about that time since the last one, and Earth's magnetic field after peaking in the last millennia BC and remaining steady until the Carrington event in 1859, then promptly proceeded to lose 10% of its strength up to the year 2000, a number the ESA updated to 15% in 2010, and while that number hasn't been updated, in 2014 and 2015 they remarked that the field loss pattern and acceleration were continuing. In 2019, the World Magnetic Model needed to be updated early for the first time ever because the field action was more than they expected. And of course, we were expecting another geomagnetic jerk based on the swarm data here in early 2020, and we've seen the Earth discharge phase peak around the corner here in the northern summer. Our book is available at spaceweathernews.com slash publications and at our general shop, otf.cells.com. We greatly appreciate your support. We've got your wind maps and shots of our star to close, and of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow. Right here, but right now, it's 5.45 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.